Hey everyone, in this video we're going to take a look at the story from chapter 26 of the Road to Latin textbook. Now this story is called De Certaminibus Quadriganum, which is talking about the chariot races in ancient Rome. Now before you dive too far in, like I always tell you at the start of these videos, if you want to see the story in a different way or get more resources on the chapter, vocab, grammar, anything like that, feel free to check out my textbook. You can find all my stuff there. It might help you out as you work your way through. But before you get too far into the story, you want to make sure that you're really good on the vocab, like I always tell you. So play a, a game, use a Quizlet, whatever it is you need to do, because it's very hard to read the stories in the chapter if you don't know what the words are, right? So you need to start there. Then you also want to, at some point, take a look at the grammar. Now, I'll give you a little quick uh, refresher, kind of, but I will say in this chapter, the grammar is very repetitive. So the Road to Latin textbook goes through a few chapters, all on third declension nouns, which I don't actually find particularly necessary. Um, it seems like they're getting into a little more minute details, which are good, right? And it'll help you with the grammar, but it's not overly necessary to be able to read and understand Latin. So for the next couple chapters, whenever they're dealing with third declension nouns, you'll hear me kind of gloss over it a little bit. But if you're still a little shaky and you're not sure what I mean by a third declension noun, or you just want the practice, feel free to go um, look at the website, uh, take a look at my textbook. Like I have all my notes there. You know, kind of help you through, but you want to make sure that you do have a good foundation in general on what a third declension noun is so that you can understand what's going on in the story. Then, like I always tell you, you want to make sure that you're reading this story aloud. So you can read it by yourself. It doesn't really matter, but don't read it in your head. Read it out loud. Practice your speaking, your pronunciation. If you can find a classmate or someone to read it to, that's always the best because they can read it back to you as well. And then you're both kind of practicing your speaking and listening skills. But those are really important, right? When it comes to reading Latin, not necessarily translating. You've heard me say this dozens and dozens of times. Reading is different than translating, right? When you go word for word translation, that's a different skill. And I think reading is the more important one. So so practice speaking this out loud, um, bring it to life. And you never want to shut off your speaking and listening skills. It might help you really unlock the language. So never do that. Um, try to bring all of them together as you work your way through these chapters. So like I said, the first thing I want to do is just give you a quick overview of the grammar. But it's going to be very short and sweet because like I said, there's really nothing new here. Okay. If you understand third declension nouns from the last chapter, the last couple chapters, you are fine um, with this chapter as well. There's nothing really crazy here. What we're trying to do at the end of the day is just understand this chart. You've seen me put it up before. Do you know what declension a noun is? Do you understand how the endings work? Do you have a bit of a concept of the gender, right? Mask and feminine and neuter. And you want to get really good at practicing. You don't need to memorize this chart. You can, of course, that's a good option. But if you just read and practice a lot, right, using, um, you know, the resources I have on my textbook, for instance, like Magistrula, you learn this chart without actually having to memorize it. And it's always better to learn it through practice than just sitting and memorizing a chart. OK, but one way or another, you want to make sure that you're in a place where you feel like you understand what's going on here. And if you don't pause the video, go back and make sure that you've looked through the notes. so You can understand what's happening before you dive into the story. OK, if you feel like you're in a good place, what we're going to do now is read through the story. Um, you want to already have done this, right? You don't necessarily want me to be the first one reading it to you. But again, I always tell you, do the read and reread method. Read, read through it once. Write down any vocab words you don't understand, any grammar that you don't understand. Write it down. Go over it, right? Spend some time looking up the words and trying to understand the grammar and then go back and read the story again. On your second, third, fourth, how many times you need to read through it, you should be able to do it without needing a dictionary and without having to look up any of the grammar. Once you're there, you know you're in a really good place. So let's take a look now. And if your translation is pretty close to mine, um, you can feel pretty good that you're in the right spot. It doesn't have to be exactly mine, but as long as you're on the right track, you're good. So the story starts like this. You have Nu Cornelius, cum filiis cir cum maximum intra. So you're saying now Cornelius with his sons, cum filiis, right, with his, his two boys, he enters the Circus Maximus. And again, if you didn't look up um, the culture from the last chapter, look it up. Um, you can find it on my website. The Circus Maximus is a really, really important and, and interesting building, right, where they would have the chariot races. You want to do a little background on what it is so you can understand what we're referencing in this chapter. OK, but they're going to watch a, a chariot race. So then you have Magno cum Gaudio, Pueri in subcellis sede. So with great joy, Magno cum Gaudio means with like great happiness or great joy, the Pueri, right? There's your subject, the boys. They are sitting in subcellis means on benches, okay? So the Circus Maximus, you're going to get a description here. There's long kind of benches, these stone benches where everyone would sit. That's what it's referencing here, okay? So the boys are really happy to be there and sitting on the benches. Then it continues. And you have Circus Maximus Pueros Delecta. So the Circus Maximus delights the boys, right? They're happy to be there. 
Circus Maximus est Aedificium Longum. So the Circus Maximus is a long building, right? Aedificium is a neuter word, second declension. That's why you have the UM here being nominative singular. It's a long building, which is true. It's longer than it is wide because you got to think it's a, it's a racetrack, basically, right? So think of a, uh, you know, like a modern track, <clears throat> then you'll have the exact same idea. Then you have in medio circo maximo est magna arena. So in the middle of the circus maximus, right, in medio, in the middle of it, there is a big um, arena. Now, the word arena is kind of interesting. It actually comes from the word sand, and it's talking about sort of the sand track um, where, uh, you know, the games would happen. So you can see it in the picture to the right. This is like a reconstruction um, of, a, of a, a chariot, right, a circus um, for chair racing. And you can see the ground is, is sand, right? That's the arena they're talking about. Then you have um, sol, arenam illuminat. So the sun, sol, right? That's a, a third declension word, right? The sun illuminates, right? It brightens or shines on the arena, okay? Because it's it's open air. There's no um, there's no roof, right? So the sun would shine on. Then you have kirkum arenam sunt subcelia. So around the arena, there are seats, benches, however you want to uh, translate that, right? There's seating, which you can see in the picture, right? Um, you have the track, the arena in the middle, and then you have rows and rows of seating. Okay. De subcellis spectatores ludo spectan. So from the chairs or the, the benches, rather the seats, you might say from their seats, the spectatores, right? The spectators watch the games, right? The spectators spectant, they watch. Um, so they watch the games, right? You're sitting in a seat <clears throat> and this is how it works. Just like a modern arena, nothing too crazy there. Then you have the next part. You have in circo maximo, so multa genera hominum. So in the circus maximus, there are many. Um, genera means like types. It can also mean peoples or, or sometimes races, things like that. But here probably is better uh, best translated as types. And you'll notice it's third declension, um, neuter plural, right? That's why you have the a ending, right? It comes from genus, meaning like a, a type or a race. So here it's saying there are many types of people, hominum, right? There's a variety of people in the crowd. And that's one of the things you can learn from the culture. The Circus Maximus um, attracts a lot of different people. And it's one of the few places you'd probably be able to see the Roman emperor, right? So the, the, the circus is connected to the Palatine Hill. So there's a box for the emperor. And I believe there's a tunnel leading to it, if I remember right. So it might be the only place you actually see um, sort of the royalty of, of ancient Rome. But you'd have a wide range of people there. So you have sunt duques, mercatores, agricolae, servi. So there are leaders, duques, right? Leaders, merchants, the mercatores, the agricolae, the farmers, and the servi, the slaves, right? So all different variety of people there. De subcellis, pueri, magno, studio, arenam, spectan. So from the benches or from their seats, the boys watch, right, spectan. They watch the arena, the arena, there's your direct object. They watch it with great zeal or enthusiasm, right, studio. It's ablative because it's it's saying how they're watching the, um, the, the games, right, with great zeal, great enthusiasm. Then you have arena, muro, angusto, dividitor. Um, so the arena, right, the arena, here you have a passive voice verb. Um, dividitor means is divided. It's present tense passive voice. So you're saying the arena is divided. Remember when you have a passive voice verb, you're looking for the ablative, right? Either the ablative of means or of agent. When it's a thing, we call it the ablative of means, um, which is muro, angusto, by a narrow wall right? So it's divided by a narrow wall. That's important. You can see it in the picture too. If you don't have the wall down the middle, you don't have a track, right? You got to think there needs to be size of the track um, so people know where to go and like directions. That's what that um, that wall does. Then you have nomen muri angusti as spina. So the name of the narrow wall is spina, spine, right? It's the same word in English for spine. That's what they call the, um, the dividing wall in the middle of the track. In spina, sunt statuae clarorum arigarum et equorum. So in the spine or on the spina, right, that, that narrow wall, there are statues, statuae. Then you have a bunch of genitives because it's statues of famous aurigarum, famous um, charioteers, and of famous equorum, horses. Okay, so there'd be statues of basically charioteers and their horses. Remember, we've kind of hit on um, the, the charioteers are very well known, but their horses are also famous too. You'd have a team that you root for. You would know um, their horses, the, the riders, all these things. They'd have um, statues of the most famous ones in the middle of the arena for everyone to see. Um, and this, by the way, always reminds me of like a um, <clears throat> like a modern uh, sports uh, venue, right? You go to a football game, <clears throat> excuse me, something like that. And you're going to see statues of famous players, things like that. That's kind of what it's um, what it's referring to here. Similar idea. Then you have prope terminus spinae, so columnae altae. So near the the terminus, right? The um, 
uh, and the terminus of the ends is really what it means, right? The different ends. So near the ends of the spina, spina here is genitive, right? So near the ends of the uh, spina, there are columnae alta, there are high columns, and you can actually see it. You might have to kind of squint a little bit or zoom in, but in the picture to the right, you can see they've put those columns there. So at the very edge of the, the wall, meaning on the ends, right, you'd put columns, and these are uh, sometimes called, um, well, they're going to see here, they have the meti, the turning posts. So you'd have them there as like a way of telling the chariot tiers where they need to make their turn. So you have columnae sunt metai. There we go. So the columns are, are the metai, the turning posts. In summa spina, prope metas judice stant. So on the, the highest uh, part or on top, you might say, of, of the spina, of the spine, um, near the metas, near the turning post, um, the judice stand, the judges stand. So you'd have like referees or judging, uh, judges standing on that uh, wall and they're watching to make sure that like everything's going all right is kind of the idea. Kirkum spinam equi. So the horses fly, and again, it doesn't mean like a bird flying. It means they're going really fast, right? They fly around the spina, <clears throat> right around that um, that wall in the middle. So again, here we're getting a pretty good description of the, the physical size and dimensions and kind of what's in the Circus Maximus and also how the chariot races work, right? You have the, uh, the, the chariots with the horses going around. Um, you know, you have statues, all these things people are watching. It's giving you a description of what the actual building looks like and the races that happen inside of them. Then we move on to the next part. And you have none es tempus certaminus pater, rogant pueri. So uh, none, remember when you're asking a yes or no question, if you put none, it really means surely. You're expecting a yes <clears throat> to be the answer, right? So it is a yes or no question, but you're really expecting yes. So this you can translate as surely it's time. It is the time, you might say, the tempest um, of the competition, the kertaminus, right, of the, of the game, you might say, or the race, rather, right? So he's, uh, the boys are asking, so Rogan Pueri, the boys ask, surely it's it's the time of the race or the competition. Father, father is vocative, right? So they're asking their dad, they're calling him by name. Then you have the response, nondum me fili respond at Cornelius. So uh, Cornelius responds, he says, not yet, nondum, right? So no, not yet, my boys. So they were expecting a yes answer and they actually get a no one, right? It's not yet time. So the, the boys are wrong here. And again, me fili is, um, is vocative. He's talking to his kids. And he continues and he says, ante kertamen semper est pompa. So before the kertamen, before the competition, there is always a pompa, a, pr a parade or a procession, Okay. Pompa per vias ad circum maximum iter facet. So the parade uh, goes, you might say, travels, iter facet, literally makes a journey through the vias, per vias, through the roads, right? Ad circum maximum to the circus maximus. So he's talking about the parade to get into the circus maximus where people will be able to see the, the chariots and getting ready for the race, okay? In pompa sunt equi aurigai viri clari imagines pulcrae deorum. So in the procession, in the pompa, the parade, there are horses, right, equi, aurigai, charioteers, viri clari, famous men, right, important men, you're probably thinking like politicians, something like that, famous men, and imagines pulcrae, beautiful images. So the imagines are really like statues. They're basically like heads. I don't think it's a full statue, but they're heads of, um, of the gods. Deorum here is, is telling you that gender plural. Um, images of the gods. So these are like religious statues, right? There is sort of always a religious element um, involved here in the, in the procession. So you'd see sort of statues or heads of the gods too. And then you have mox pompa, portam intrabit et per arenam veniet. So soon the pompa, the, um, the, the procession, right? It will enter intrabit, it's future tense by the bi. So it will enter the gate, the portam, and uh, when yet it will come per arena through the arena. So there is a procession in the actual arena itself too, where you get to wave and cheer on your team and all these things. Okay, so the procession is a big part of it. Then we have um, this last part here. You have, uh, or it starts the last part anyway. You have porta aperitor clamat Lucius pompa when it. So it's uh, Lu Lucius, right? Lucius is shouting. He says the gate aperitor is opening, right? Um, or is being opened, you might say, right? So the gate is being opened. Pompa win it. The, the parade is coming, right? So he sees that the, they're opening the gate, right? You have a passive voice verb here. So literally the gate is being opened and the parade is coming through. Then you have post pompam, spectatoris signum certaminus expectam. So after the parade, right, the procession, the spectators are waiting for expectant, right? They wait for, they look for the signum certaminus, the signal of the competition, right? Someone needs to start the race. Think of, uh, you know, in like a, a, a NASCAR race or something like that, waving the flag to make everyone go. There needs to be a signal. You have signum ad domino ludorum dator. 
So the signal is given dot or it's passive voice, present tense, right? It is given. And again, we need the, the ablative to tell us who's doing it. Here, it's what we call the ablative of agent. And since it's a person, you put ah, the preposition, plus ablative. So it's given by the domino ludorum, by the master of the games. Then you have quadrigai maxima cum caleritate in arena volant. So the quadrigai, the chariots, again, the four horse chariots, um, they volant, they fly in arena, into the arena, right? Maxima cum caleritate with the greatest speed. So what they're referencing here is there would be, um, if I remember correctly, a starting gate where all the, the chariots start and then they, they rush into the arena, right? You have to kind of start a little further back and then go into the track. That's what they're referencing here. So they're not all starting on the track. There is actually a starting gate. Then you have per septem spatia equi circum spinam volant. So the per septem spatia, uh, you can translate this for seven laps. It literally says something like uh, through seven spaces is kind of what it literally says, but it really means laps, right? So for seven laps, the equi, the horses, volant, they fly circum spinam around the spina, right? Around that um, that wall in the middle. So this is a pretty typical, um, you know, from what I know about uh, chariot races, they race for seven laps, okay? So they're pretty short, I mean, relatively, and you can do a bunch of them in a day, right? There's not just one happening. Now you get the final little paragraph here, paragraphs, and you have vulnera aurigarum sub multa. The wounds of the charioteers, aurigarum is gender plural, are multa, are many, right? So it's dangerous being a charioteer. Okay, so if you dive into it and read about it, they are, they're not only bumping into each other um, and maybe even like hitting each other as they go by, but there's a lot of crashes, right? So there's a lot of wounds. Interdum aurigai interficiuntur quod super capita et corpora miserorum reliquae quadrigae volant. So the, um, sometimes, interdum, right? Sometimes the charioteers are killed. Interficiuntur is passive voice. They are killed, which is true. They die because um, above or over their capita, their heads, again, there's your third declension, um, neuter noun, it's accusative here, but over their heads and bodies, reliquae quadrigae, the rest of, or the other chariots, volant, they fly. So it's saying the other chariots will fly over the, the heads and bodies of the miserorum, of the miserable people, right? The miserable um, charioteers who fall, aurigai, if you want to think of it that way. So this is a really kind of uh, uh, unfortunate um, or sort of graphic description of the chair races, but it is true. If you crash and fall off your chariot, this is a really good shot. You're going to get crushed, right? And that's why it's so dangerous. And there are a lot of wounds and deaths in these, uh, in these races, right? Which again, is sort of like today, right? If you're racing a car, I mean, there's an element of danger here. And these people are on chariots flying around, bumping into each other. It would be inherently dangerous to do. Then you have meus auriga est in spatio extremo clamat aulus, right? So my charioteer is in literally the furthest space. It means he's out ahead, right? So he's, or you might even say on the last lap is probably what they mean, right? Um, extremo, the furthest lap, if we're, if we're thinking of spatio as a lap. So aulus is shouting, saying, my guy's in first place. He's on the last lap, right? Volat kirko metam extremum. He's flying around the metam extremum, the farthest um, turning post, uh, turning post. You may even say the last turning post. Then you have reliquos aurigas relinquit. He is left behind, or he he leaves behind. He is leaving behind, right? Relinquit. He's leaving behind the reliquos aurigas, the rest of the charioteers. So Aulus's guy is in first place. He's flying around. He's already going around the last turn. Um, he kind of left everyone in the dust, right? Then you have est victor. He is the victor, uh, the the winner, not the victor, right? He's the victor, right? So he won. So Aulus's uh, charioteer ends up winning the race. Okay. So it's a good story to get you back on third declension nouns and practice again, right? You see a lot of them in here. A bunch of them are neuter, which is kind of a continuation of what we did last chapter. But again, if you have any questions at all, if you have any trouble translating this, feel free to put it in the comments below and I'm happy to help you. But think of what I said about um, getting vocab and grammar first, doing the read and reread method. This is how you get really good at Latin because the more times you practice it and read it, the easier it will get. And you're, again, you're trying to hit a point where you can read through this without having to constantly look up every single word. So hopefully you're feeling pretty good and hopefully you're at that point or about to get to that point. But again, if you need anything else, um, let me know. Otherwise, keep at it and good luck.